she is, in my view, in the end, a gift to uh, her opponents in the Conservative Party, to the sort of sane mainstream. Because what could be better to our argument than the fact that she is associated with all of these arguments, having failed as Prime Minister within, uh, you know, little more than a month? Uh, it demonstrates that what she's suggesting doesn't work. And I wrote at the beginning of her premiership that her problem will not be winning the leadership. It will be the fight that she now has with reality, a fight which reality always wins. <laughs> Yeah, we're back. Here we are again then. It is How to Win an Election with me, Matt Chorley, joined uh, in the studio by Polly McKenzie and Daniel Finkelstein and Peter Manelson beaming in from outer space. Where are you, Peter? I'm in Oxford, Matt. Oh, posh. <laughs> Very posh. I'm here uh, attending the board, of which I'm a member of the Graduate Scholarship Programme, the Erdogan Programme, and we're spending two days selecting which of the lucky... Um, candidates who are going to become Erdogan scholars. H have you met any podcast listeners on your travels? Yeah, I met three last night. Three. I made a, All of I them. made, I made, <laughs> I made a, br a brief sort of cameo VIP appearance at the 20th anniversary dinner of the Oxford Media Society. Very good. Said a few words, encouraged them all to become good journalists in the future, uh, and I did a, a room test. Uh, no, there were more than three, but by the time I'd finished, I mean, I think they were all busy subscribing Very on the way right. home. Quite right, too. <laughs> so you, you asked us, uh, Matt, that we should try and be viral this week, and yeah. my wife, Brenton, you pointed out to me that I then got a massive cold, yes. which lasted all week, which was a form of going viral, but viral, maybe but I'd misunderstood the instruction. Not quite, viral. Let's quite see if, the viral we had in mind. Let's see if we can go viral uh, this week. Um, if you want to get in touch, you can email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, or you can WhatsApp us, 0333 003 2353. O triple three double O three two three five three. Send us a voice note so we can we can hear uh, your uh, disdain. Uh, right now, on uh, before we get to what we're going to talk about this week, let's talk about let's round up any other business. So last week we talked about politicians being unwise to say they'd seen the green shoots of economic recovery, uh, and on the very same day, just a few hours after we spoke, Rishi Sunak went to the NFU conference and said this: People are in the beginning of this year feeling that the economy has turned a corner. They do see those green shoes. They can see that things are getting better. So, uh, was that wise, Danny, for him to say that? It doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you can ping that thing. Uh, the, the only thing that... I always see politicians having this row about whether the economy is getting better, using terms like GDP that most people don't uh, understand or wouldn't use themselves. All that matters is whether he's right or not. He, he, he does. If if he said it and he's right, obviously he should emphasise that narrative. Uh, if he if he if he's not right, obviously he shouldn't say it. It probably won't matter as much though as the fact that it's not happening. Um, so, you know, I do think, um, you know, re revising, revising my uh, joke a little about it not mattering, I do think if the economy is heading in the right direction, Rishi Sunak should definitely hammer this home. That should be the centre of his campaign. Uh, but if it's not, then he obviously shouldn't. So he, the judgment is merely about whether he's correct or not. But I think using a green shoots metaphor at the NFU with oh, the farmers... yeah. Very that's droll. good, good Very audience, droll. audience engagement. So well done. I would have liked to it's see like, the metaphor extended. It's like, a, like a comedian who sort of tailors his material. You know, if you're doing the house builders after dinner speech or, you know, Absolutely. building blocks. I mean, during the coalition years, Vince Cable would endlessly extend the metaphor about the patient is in intensive care and then the patient has been moved from intensive care to the high dependency unit. The patient is now <laughs> going through some extended uh, physiotherapy to support their... Do, and, I think that you could do that with the economy as well at the NFU. It would be really fun. Uh, thinking about the manure that you need in the yeah. soil and then the nitrates and then you need to do the weeding. Uh, yeah. This is the limit of Baldwin. my agricultural knowledge. Baldwin used to use all these agricultural... Um, he saw himself as, as a sort Stanley of Stanley Baldwin. Stanley Baldwin, yeah. I saw some interesting polling. Uh, this about Stanley Baldwin? No, not about <laughs> Stanley Baldwin. But actually about... Um, so a Conservative had suggested that in some polls, in some areas, they're only five points behind. And it is true that in the top 100 constituencies for NFU membership, the Conservatives are now only four points behind. 
But that is a shift from 30 points ahead yeah. in 2019. I was going to say, it's a, it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a directional thing there. Yeah. And Peter, the issue is, and I remember because we talked about this a bit last week about green shoots and all that, is that what you what you don't want to do is be talking about green shoots and everything's looking up if, if the public mood is that things are grim or getting worse. Well, he was talking up the economy uh, the other week and then suddenly we discovered we were in a technical recession. So, you know, beware of the statistical surprise. I mean, I think the more he <coughs> talks things up, the more he will sound as if he's exaggerating the good news and the greater will be the disbelief amongst voters. I think he's got to wait for things to speak for themselves. He's got to wait for things to turn around if they do and allow people to feel the change themselves. I think the more he sort of drags people in that direction and forces them to drink uh, uh, all this, all this good news and all this water. The 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 more resistant the public will be. Um, I, the, the the without being too pernickety, but it is important. I think we have been in technical recession, and the question is whether we're still in it. Uh, obviously, that's that's vital. I think we're really agreeing, right? The the prime minister cannot drag people to see the economy differently to the way they see it because ultimately people don't look at things like the economy as a as a as an abstract idea they look at how well off they are their families are their community is and uh, how well off it's likely to be uh, over the coming months and where therefore whether they think things are going in the right direction and that allows him obviously as we've discussed before to run you know or to try and run because i think it's going to be very difficult even if the economy begins to pick up to try and run britain's on the right track don't turn back uh, rather than better the devil you know so we'll we'll see um whether he's right or not yeah. but if he is right peter I th if if he's correct in detecting this, he's not just pulling it, uh, then he would be right, I think, technically. Wouldn't you advise to begin to emphasise that? If let, Let's assume that he's correct, that there is an economic um, re recovery just beginning to be underway. I question it, but let's assume that's correct. In that case, he would be right, wouldn't he? To I do think this? on balance, he would be right to fight the election and the months preceding it you know, on, on an economy that's improving than small boats, Islamicism, um, all the other things about which they're tearing themselves apart in the meantime, which just looks sort of completely uh, chaotic. But, you know, we've had one national insurance cut and the polling evidence would suggest that people either sort of don't feel the change the better or they do and it's so minimal they just discount it and I think he has to be very careful about the budget uh, next week if the Times is correct and that he's going to go for a, a further modest tax cut I think he's got two, two, two problems um, g given all the other tax increases that are taking place whether it's really going to make a, a difference to people's uh, personal finances and secondly whether people will feel that it's you know the right time to reward ourselves with uh, tax cuts, yeah. however uh, modest. And when people look around them, and you know, let's remember this, you know, we're facing continued cumulative cuts in public spending on community services and public services. And people look around them and they just sort of see a sort of desolation. Um, and that doesn't make them feel good either. So, look, you know, he can try his best, but I think it will only make a marginal difference. Well, let's see what happens, because obviously, you know, while he's trying to talk about the economy and tax cuts and so on, uh, the, the Conservative Party saw the Labour Party getting into a mess last week and thought, ha, 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 hang on a minute, we can turn that into into a mess for us instead, uh, Polly. We were talking last week about, uh, well, it was in the run-up to what was going to be the vote on the, the Gaza ceasefire. Clearly, Wednesday was a, was a huge moment for the SNP, because they wanted to vote for one. Uh, the Labour Party uh, didn't want to um, go down the road and Lindsay Hall and all that. But now, almost a week on, this is somehow the Conservatives through the, the medium of Lee Anderson have conspired to turn this into a problem for them. Well, you know, when you are struggling in politics, you do, it's very easy to start wounding yourself as they have. <laughs> I mean, thinking about the, the Gaza vote itself, you know, it's been endlessly discussed, but it, it made Parliament look terrible. Uh, and, and I know Danny has been kind of uh, talking and, and thinking about that quite deeply, you know, what it actually means for a Parliament to alter its rules in the context of potentially violent threats to our parliamentarians. 
but but the reality is that the rules of Parliament are set up in, in my view, a very stupid way. Now, you will not remember this, but there was a moment uh, when Ming Campbell was the leader of the Liberal Democrats where... I do remember a, a, it. Where, ..where all of the Lib Dems walked out. Yeah. Um of Parliament because they couldn't get an amendment, uh, they couldn't get a vote on their amendment. Uh, and, and, and in a way, that's the exact same sort of parliamentary dilemma, that the way it's set up is you're only allowed to have a vote on one amendment because Parliament is still ossified around a belief that there are only two parties, only two answers to any question, and the desire to kind of pull everything into a binary choice. I think impairs debate and it does mean that in those few opportunities that an opposition party gets to uh, actually control the debate, instead of doing what on this issue, but frankly on so many issues, uh, all of the parties should be thinking about, how do you find a place of consensus? How do you identify a way for Parliament to stand together it, they just take this tiny opportunity to try and pick holes and embarrass I, their political enemies. OK, well, I, I yeah, do I disagree think... with that. To put your pieces, sorry, you first. No, 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 you go, Danny. Well, I do disagree with that um, on this particular occasion, certainly, um, that there were basically uh, two um, proposals. One was that we should insist that the Israelis declare an immediate ceasefire and the other that... Um, there were certain conditions that needed to be met in order for us to have uh, a sustainable um, ceasefire. And the Labour Party's amendment was that we should have both, uh, and th th which is impossible. And the reason they put that amendment in is because they don't want to make a decision between the two other ones because the pressure on their politi them politically is too great. So actually, in this particular incident, having both amendment, uh, both the Labour as well as the SNP and government amendments, all three amend, um, motions, um, led to greater confusion and less clarity. I, I agree that there may be occasions when Parliament would benefit from the ability to consider a third uh, possibility, and there can be occasions where people can come together. But actually, on this occasion, when really the attempt was to have a debate of some intellectual focus on the issue of Gaza, we, we failed partly because for reasons I totally understand, and there are lots of issues obviously in which the Tories have this problem too, because the Labour Party is under too much pressure to be able to have a clear position. Um, but Peter, isn't, isn't this, this whole saga another example of how somehow Keir Starmer ends up being the luckiest man in politics? That, you know, he was up against Boris Johnson on Partygate and benefited from that hugely, then Liz Truss, and now, you know, it, it perhaps the most crucial moment for his leadership, this certainly this year, in an election year, which could have caused resignations and rebellions and endless hand-wringing and, and so on. And instead, luck, whether it was because he gave, uh, he twisted the arm of Lindsay Hall or not, but but he's ended up getting through this unscathed. Is, it, is he making his own luck? Well, it's uh, probably, as ever in politics, a mixture of luck uh, and skill. I think Dan is being a little unfair uh, to to Starmer and, and, and to Labour. You know, it's by no means sort of clear or simple, you know, what position you should take at this precise moment as far as Gaza is concerned. Because, you know, people do feel that Israel has the right to self-defence. People do feel, I certainly feel, that Israel has uh, the right to go after uh, the Hamas military leadership and capability that inflicted such sort of ghastliness, ghastly ghastliness on on their people on October uh, the 7th. But they've now reached a point at Rafa uh, where it's going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, uh, to keep going after uh, the Hamas military uh, uh, operatives uh, without inflicting just completely unacceptable casualties. Uh, and disaster on the civilian population. So it is really very difficult. I mean, I do think that we shouldn't take the procedural shenanigans last week sort of completely sort of seriously. Um, you know, the fact is that the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists, uh, were, in, uh, were not focused on the fighting in Gaza. They were focused on their fight with mm. Labour uh, in Scotland, they weren't trying to find a solution for the plight of the uh, Palestinians. They were trying to sort of score points uh, off Labour. They were engaged. Peter, they were, they were engaged. 
they were engaged in a sort of Palestinian one-upmanship. But and does, of isn't that politics? It, but, but, so let's not let's not take so seriously, you know, the the the, the, the procedural mess, which uh, I fully accept, uh, Lindsay Hoyle. Uh, through the best possible motives, I guess, got himself into a terrible quagmire, uh, uh, and hopefully he'll be able to move on and leave that behind him. I do take it seriously because that is what my view is, this kind of rather undignified row is what Parliament is actually for. Most of us, most of the time, have a top-level view of issues, um, and we, we may not, and people don't know the details of a lot of politics, they may not know the identity of an individual minister, they may not be able to tell you who the speaker or deputy speaker might be but in parliament they do know that and without that we would have almost no accountability that's that's yeah, but the, Danny, this, the method yeah, of Danny. calling politics to account is through is through precisely what seems to everyone petty it's because it seems to everyone petty that it actually matters it doesn't seem i didn't say petty i just think that what uh the smp were trying to do was to short shoehorn everyone's you know, quite sort of subtle views into a rather unsubtle, one-sided motion. Yeah. And I don't think people wanted to go but, there. But the rules of Parliament force parties to behave in this way. And proce procedure matters enormously. And the reality is that we have incredibly stuck old-fashioned procedures in our Parliament and they bring out the worst in our political leaders, in my view. And uh, we should be really ambitious about thinking about how process and procedure can bring the best out of our political leaders instead. I'm sorry, I, I really don't agree with that. Well, let's... You look, look at what <laughs> happened during the Brexit time when it was incredibly difficult to get a majority of the House of Commons uh, down on you know, one of three or four uh, different options. And of course you had to use procedure in an imaginative way in order to try and enable <laughs> Parliament. That's what John Burke you know, was doing. Uh, to, well, yeah, for better or for worse. <laughs> Um, well, but you know, you do worse, you do try to. Yeah, let's not. You, let's well, not uh, move. arguably yes, but you know, it is it is not easy, uh, uh, you know, to to find or define a position uh, which is sufficiently balanced and subtle to reflect. Uh, what is an incredibly complex yeah, yeah. situation, so, yeah, and in one in which we, it's we very difficult just a very to, quick to, thing. to present in a black and white we way. We need to move on. OK, just a very quick thing. I, I don't disagree with you, but I don't think on any of the major issues that are involved in this, either Palestine or actually what we, what then happened with Brexit. But I do do disagree very strongly about the role the traditional process can have in Parliament. I think it. I think that this whole uh, row was kind of worth having, the the, the SNP is entitled to try to expose where Labour stands on this issue. That is actually what Parliament... And actually what it tells us about, if, we, if, if, if the polls are right, <coughs> Keir Starmer becomes Prime Minister, he's not going to be able to hide divisions within his own party I by being the, the, third, the third wing of that, all that. I, I want to ask a sort of a big question of what Rishi Sunak should do about Liz Truss and is there some advantage to him doing something bold uh, with uh, his immediate predecessor? She's been at the Conservative P Political Action Conference or CPAC in the US last week and over the weekend. She gave a 15-minute speech entitled Taking Back Our Parties. And you can hear her alongside former Trump chief strategist Steve Bannon. The economic establishment in Britain wanted to keep things the way they were. And they did. They got me. But I have learned from that, Steve. You did. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Was it The Economist that got you? Was it the Financial Times of London? Are these the people we got? This they're, is the party the, at the, the city the, of London. These, are they these, the ones that run the deal these, over there? These, these are the friends of the bureaucratic establishment. They are the friends of the deep state. She later appeared alongside Steve Bannon on a TV channel called Real America's Voice, where Bannon discussed Nigel Farage's warning that a radical Islamic party could gain seats in Parliament. I don't understand this. The grooming situation, Tommy Robinson, all these heroes fought it. The rape situation, and in that community, you're going to have a special election, and you may have a radical jihadist party send somebody to Commons that, after that all that correct. problem. That is correct. So that was Steve Bannon talking about the far-right activist Tommy Robinson. He called him a hero, and Liz Truss nodded along, as you can hear there, and then said, 
That is correct. So, Danny, what should Rishi Sunak do about Liz Truss? Well, I, the state of that, honestly, really, it's the most depressing thing. I, I, I went to visit Liz Truss when she was Justice Secretary to discuss with her a speech she wanted to deliver on the importance of the rule of law and uh, something that I care about a lot. And I noticed that on the shelf in her office, uh, she had uh, live at the centre Roy Jenkins's memoirs. So I picked it up and Liz Truss said to me, uh, he's my hero about Roy Jenkins. And now she is appearing on platforms with Steve Bannon um, and basically, uh, you know, failing to call out comments about uh, Tommy Robinson. But more importantly, because, I, you know, she could, I suppose, say, you know, she wasn't listening or she wasn't commenting on that particular item or whatever, lame excuse she might have. She, she literally described The Economist magazine as being a friend of the deep state. I mean, it's completely out to lunch, really. Um, uh, 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 you know, and so I I, I really, I, in some ways, um, so I've been saying from the beginning that if Rishi Sunak wants to uh, be able to fight a general election on a stable footing, he has to say Liz Truss was a disaster. I'm the change from Liz Truss. And he has not said that, and he's therefore got the problem that the more eccentric her public pronouncements are, the more problematic they are for him because he hasn't drawn that line. Um, <clears throat> I still, you know, I think that, that he could still do that now and this has given him an additional chance to to do that. Uh, she's, in my view, in the end, a gift to uh, her opponents in the Conservative Party, to the sort of sane mainstream, because what could be better to our argument than the fact that she is associated with all of these arguments, having failed as Prime Minister within, uh, you know, little more than a month. Uh, it demonstrates that what she's suggesting doesn't work. And I wrote at the beginning of her premiership, uh, her problem will not be winning the leadership. It will be the fight that she now has with reality, a fight which reality always wins. And that's what happened. Danny, the, the, Danny don't you think this goes, I mean, really what you're saying is this goes to the heart of the huge strategic error that Sunak made at the beginning of his premiership when he did not explicitly uh, distance himself and cut himself from what had gone before uh, and from the sort of you know, right-wing conservative thinking which has basically become Farageist. And what he tried to do instead of, sort of defining himself in his own terms and reaching out to you know, the, the country uh, as a whole, um, he tried sort of simultaneously to basically appease uh, the activist base of his own party. And it's what yeah. happens to politicians when they try to like... ride two horses. It looks very clever at the beginning, but then as the horses... Uh, diverge, yeah. you end up doing the splits and then fall to earth. That there's still and that's time because to Sunak. It's, because Keir Starmer obviously did exactly the same thing at the beginning of his leadership. He didn't pick, um, and yep. he chose the shadow cabinet designed to uh, kind of uh, paper over that. And ultimately, he was forced to choose, and he did choose. Um, he tried so, to put unity before direction. Yeah. Uh, and I and think that's that was what a mistake. Sudan did as well. Correct. And now he can, he, it's a mistake and you can correct it. And he's corrected that in part by kicking Jeremy Corbyn out. So I suppose the question is, Polly, should Rishi Sunak do the same to Liz Truss? The one thing that the, almost, if you look at the polls, the, almost the entire nation could agree on is that Liz Truss is a disaster. You know, was it 80, she was saying, talking about the will of the people must be respected, the will of the people. Well, actually, 80% of people wanted her to resign. I thought it was a disaster. Is, is, would, there, would there be an advantage, like, to get people to, who ignored her up until now to sit up and take notice of Rishi Sunak? If he went to war with Liz Truss, would that help? So I, I think that if you are a conservative, the only time you should use the phrase the deep state is when you are denouncing the notion that there is one. You certainly shouldn't be linking The Economist to such a notion, esteemed newspaper that it is. Though I always thought it was a magazine. Don't understand why it calls itself a newspaper. That's a bit of a swerve. <laughs> I... Well, the FT was also in there, the Environment Agency, they're part of the deep state. <laughs> um, they can't even clean up the rivers, never mind bring down a government. So I, I think, you know, it, it would be a big political choice for Rishi Sunak to make. Um, and and he is struggling to make those kind of big strategic choices. We know he started off set promising to be the change that Britain needs after 30 years of something. And now he's saying that we're in the green shoots of recovery. You know, we talked about that before, like, you know, let's keep a steady ship because it's starting to work. 
Um, but he is still frightened of really making choices. He's brought David Cameron into his cabinet, which says a centrist, reasonable, uh, compassionate conservatism message. But he has also done very little to silence uh, the, the dissenting voices. And I think it's because he's frightened that there will be a breakaway from people like Lee Anderson being courted by reform. If Nigel Farage were to join reform, a sense that, in fact, that is what would really destroy them is if that kind of right-wing flank of the party was able to organise. Keir Starmer took the choice that it was better to drive those people out um, partly because they didn't have such a well-developed vehicle to go to. You know, George Galloway's party is not going to be a party that challenges Labour's integrity in the general election. The Green Party remains very uh, small uh, and, and unlikely to be able to challenge and also obviously much more uh, kind of intellectually complicated. The Liberal Democrats, similarly, not really in the sort of uh, Corbynistic camp, though there are people within the party who, who think that way. So it, it is partly electoral tactics that enabled Keir Starmer to make this choice. But from that position of strength, he has has done it. And I think that that has, has strengthened him. I, I, I do think Polly's putting her finger on a really important point here. And that is that, whereas in the case of the Labour Party, you know, pushing out the hard left and the anti-Semites really doesn't leave them with anywhere else to go. In the case of the Conservatives, there's Reform UK. And I think that sort of spectre hangs over the Conservative Party. It hangs over Sunak, that if he sort of turns on these people and really distances himself from them, you know, there may be a sort of flood uh, out of the Conservative Party into an alternative viable party that will become much more sort of dynamically placed if uh, Farage uh, hits the campaign mode as well. But basically what we're talking about in all these contortions is the um, existential challenge that is facing modern day conservatism uh, because they, they've moved away from that strand of centre-right thinking that Danny, for example, represents and articulates uh, uh, in, in our discussions to what is a very confused conservatism. I mean, they both try to embrace free market, that right, uh, economics, whilst at the same time, as we saw Liz Truss in, in the United States with Steve Bannon, etc., cetera, um, supporting an anti-free trade protectionism and petty nationalism, uh, which is the opposite uh, of free market uh, uh, economics. They don't know where they are. They're completely confused. And I think that what is this? What is an existential price uh, challenge for them at the moment? reflected, as I say, in all these contortions of Sunak, is going to become an existential crisis after the election, should they lose it, because I think there they will have to fight literally for the soul but, of well, okay. the I, I think Party, it's, and there'll be blood all over the walls. In some ways, I think it's more serious than that, actually. Um, <laughs> uh, Even so, more serious. Yes, I do, because, I, because um, it, it, there is a, a, a real demographic um, for what Liz Truss is saying, and but it's contempt possible that there will also be uh, a United States government that agrees with that. Uh, in other words, it's a proper trend uh, on the right, not just a uh, a sort of you know infelicitous um, and rather rather lame appearance by by somebody trying to excuse their own uh, defeat. And I do worry about this uh, kind of populist language some of which i think is quite unhinged really entering into uh popular discourse so i i i, I if it were simply a matter of you know the chaos in the conservative party and you would expect that you know lots of things that we're talking about are really narratives that we're attaching to the fact that it's time for a change because the conservative party has been in power for a very long time and then you can find lots of things wrong and we all get into big yeah. arguments about it and the, and but if it were merely about that, I'd take it less seriously. But actually, but I Danny, think it's about a big trend in world politics. Which but I suppose is the original, Danny, the original question was, it, it, given that nothing he's tried so far, he spent billions of pounds on tax cuts, he's tried being the change candidate, he's tried being the... By the you know, is, is there something like Boris Johnson did when he came in and he blew up you know, with the, the propagation and then he, he took the whip away from a load of... Uh, Tory MPs. He picked a side and he showed some leadership and he went into that 2019 election and actually a load of Tories peeling off. I mean, admittedly, they went to the Lib Dems rather than reform. But Tories, you know, if you if you pick a side and show some leadership, particularly when 
the majority of people think that least Chuck, least Chuck is, you know, kicking out least Chuck is essentially a victimless crime, isn't it? Well, uh, okay, I'm not sure. So th there then becomes a point about whether you think that somebody expressing um, a kind of eccentric and cack handed viewpoint is something that means you should kick them out of the party. In Jeremy Corbyn's case, it was somewhat different because of the link to race. And so, therefore, the discussion with Lee Anderson is a different one. I'm not sure I think the right the right way of dealing with this would be to remove... Actually, that's, that's weak. I, I don't think you should deal with this by removing Liz Truss from the Conservative Party. But that's party. not Matt's point, in a way. Like, none of... Ken Clark didn't really do anything wrong, got chucked out of the Conservative Party by Boris Johnson. The, the point was... I disagree with that, well, though. It, it, indeed, but, but the, as a piece of political theatre and strategy, mm. it, it did at least reclaim a piece of territory. I think the, the danger for Rishi Sunak is that it would be a much higher risk strategy, right? It might it might work to break through, but they also probably will still lose anyway. And so the question is, if you're thinking about how you're going to go down in history, really it's a choice between, I guess, the very possibility of a marginal holding on to power and the difference between obliteration and holding on to... I know, to, but to partly just thinking, he hasn't got seats. many options and is this one of them? It, it, but but I, th I so, think the, the possibility that it does lead to a massive fragmenting of yeah, the Conservative yeah. Party okay. is something he would Can be worried about. I just understand about. So I understand the grounds for, um, re we would for removing Lee Anderson. I do actually, in fact, understand the grounds for removing for losing the whip from Ken Clark and the others because they voted against the government controlling the order paper and they lost the whip. I understand that. What would be the grounds for saying Liz Truss is, you know, is not... Uh, going to be a member of the Conservative Party. I mean, the grounds that she said some well, she, very foolish thing. You'd note there would be soon no members of any political party. But you left. might look, you might uh, choose the political strategy and look for the grounds. Yeah. You know, you. And she gave quite a lot of grounds. With the okay, Tommy so. Bannon stuff, there was the um, Tommy Robinson. Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Robinson stuff. They there haven't was, got married. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just merging into a fault. <laughs> you know, the Steve Bannon stuff, the Tommy Robinson stuff, there was the the, Look, the deep state, there's the uh, asking to Nigel Farage to what come you, in and take over the Tory party. It's what you there's, decide there's backing to, Donald Trump over Joe Biden. There's it's quite what a lot you do. There. It's you what you decide to... I, I, OK, so let's not get let's not get into sideline into a row about exactly what disciplinary <laughs> measures you take. I think we all agree that the right political strategy for uh, Rishi Sunak is to use this moment... Uh, to draw a line with her. How exactly you decide to do that? You know, actually, as I listen to you, I think maybe actually all right. Um, uh, uh, so you know, I don't, I don't want to be. I don't want to be. I don't want to. You know, there's no point us having these discussions if we don't think something. Like, oh, maybe he's right. Um, so I did on that occasion. But the but Episode um, seventeen. But I finally won a. But I do, the key thing. The key thing is, um, I think we all agree that, the, that we ought to draw the line. So then there's a question of how you do it. Yeah, exactly. and then she, 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 my inclination would have been against but, yeah, removing yeah. her from the party, but I can see what you're saying. Danny, the, the title of this podcast is How to Win an Election. Yeah, yeah. I do not know in these circumstances how Rishi Sunak wins an election uh, if he doesn't draw a very clear line uh, okay. and ex explicit demarcation yeah. uh, between himself and his the former leader who is there in the United States. She's going global in order to get back into politics here. here. She's trying to find American backers and funders for her fight to reclaim her position uh, in the Tory activist uh, uh, base. OK, it's weird, it's delusional, but you know, look at what she actually signed up to. She said that there is a, uh, a, a radical jihadist party in existence in this country, uh, which is going to, you know, put a dagger to the heart of, of our democracy. That's what Bannon mm. said, and she heartily agreed with it. I don't see how Rishi Sunak uh, can tolerate that. I don't see how he can do yeah, okay. that. Well, we'll see. Does he take our advice? We know lots of senior people do uh, in all parties listen to this podcast, so maybe Rishi Sunak will, will listen and, uh, and take our advice. Right, enough uh, talking from me. Let's have a listener's question. Here's one sent in, a voice note sent in by Andrew. How much energy and effort do parties put into seats that are euphemistically described as challenging? In other words, those that are completely unwinnable. Can those candidates expect any support at all from their national parties? Do the votes that they collect make any difference? And does a candidate who is never going to win still have the potential to do damage to the national campaign? I'm speaking here as one who stood in 2005 in a seat where we were only ever going to come third. 
Peter, how much effort do you put into seats that you're not going to win? Not a lot. The, the problem at the moment, though, is that you can't tell which are the winnable uh, seats or not. I mean, for example, I live in a constituency in East Wiltshire in Devizes, which has always been conservative. Nobody would ever imagine that Labour would gain it. But I know from talking to my neighbours that the sort of anger they feel about the government and about the Conservatives is huge. They also have a sort of burning resentment of the sitting member of parliament, Danny Kruger, particularly women uh, voters locally, uh, you know, don't like him. I mean, well, they sort of like him personally, but they take great exception to his views. And I must say, I've now come to the conclusion that possibly even East Wiltshire and Devizes is winnable. And Labour's going to select its candidate in, in, in the coming weeks. I mean, there is, of course, a temptation on the other hand <laughs> to sort of leave Danny Kruger in his in place and hopefully he wins because he'll just add to the sheer sort of identity crisis and pandemonium that's going to envelop the Conservative Party after the election if they uh, lose. But either way, you've got to, I think we can take rather more seriously seats that previously that, that we've just sort of consigned uh, and not bothered with, because I think this could, has the potential uh, to be a real uh, sea change yeah. election in very many seats. The re Sorry, go on, Polly. So Peter's right. You need to concentrate your resource in the places where you can win, but you don't necessarily know where those are going to be. And it's those judgments about which ones are the write-offs. And that's most difficult, kind of practically and emotionally, if it's a seat that you already hold that is a write-off. Um, and, and also which ones where, where actually a, a, a real push might get you over the edge. But, you know, right up into the last few days, the, uh, parties are making these decisions and where they can persuade the activists to move, trying to move activists. Um, Labour Party moved quite yeah. a lot of activists to prevent Luciana Berger, for example, from uh, winning a seat for the Liberal Democrats in, in 2019. Uh, the Liberal Democrats made a mistake in 2010. We expanded our reach too much. We tried for too many seats. We got kind of blindsided by the polls and spread ourselves too thinly. And in 2015, we tried to defend too many. I think the Conservatives are trying to defend too many this time and it will cost them. Danny? So uh, when I was uh, 24 years old, I fought Brent East for the SDP and I did it knowing that we would come third, um, but still thinking it was worth it. And you, when you're the candidate, as Andrew will know, you know, who asked this question, you end up putting a huge amount of effort. Of, the National Party does give you all the posters and invites you to... Um, these national meetings and so it does care about and make sure that you're on the ballot paper because that's important and it does care <laughs> if, you know no but you know in other words number could, one for how to win no, an election because they don't well you know because there was a period for example when that the, the uh, liberal party didn't run everywhere um so that decision's important so these things matter and yes by the way any candidate can really embarrass the party and sometimes in these seats which aren't winnable you don't take the care that you should then you end up with 24-year-old people like me who shouldn't be in. <laughs> <laughs> Causing endless embarrassment ever since. Uh, but that brings us to the end of How to Win Election. Thank you to Peter Madison, Polly McKenzie and Daniel Finkelstein. You can email your questions to howtowin at thetimes.co.uk. How to Win an Election, wherever you get your podcasts from.